Right, what I want to try and convince you is that economic analysis and economic data can usefully contribute to an analysis of the policies that we need to address the massive problem of climate change. But it will need to be done in collaboration with engineers, psychologists, politicians, climatologists, working together and in particular thinking of very carefully how we are going to persuade people to adopt the policies that we know are necessary. Welcome Professor David Lieber here tonight. Um, he's going to speak on the economics of climate change. Um, I think it's a topic we're all pretty involved with during the past, past years. And yes, thank you so much for coming. And this is our fourth event of the time. And next week we'll have a couple of events on, um, firstly, big data in the 21st century and the Greeks and <coughs> society in their economy. So please welcome Professor David Newberry. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, now, I take it as my task to convince you that economics is really useful for addressing complicated problems of which this is about the most complicated. So I should tell you, first of all, what our energy policy research group is. We've been essentially uh, doing research on, in the first instance, electricity, but then increasingly gas and carbon markets uh, since the privatization of the electricity industry in this country. And as you probably know, the UK has been very much in the forefront of restructuring electricity markets. And as a result, our research group is widely consulted on by a very wide range of other countries. In fact, at the moment, we're working with China on their electricity market reform. And I sit in Ireland where they're doing, uh, adapting their market to the new requirements of the third electricity directive. Um, we advise a lot of people, but one of the most useful things is that we have corporate members who not only pay us, which is very helpful for supporting research, but with whom we interact. So we ask them, well, what are the really pressing problems that you face? And then we tell them, well, what are the research findings that we are working on? And that's a very good way of keeping honest, because unless somebody is interested in what you're doing, there's really not very much point in doing it. Uh, so we're getting a lot of feedback, not just from uh, electricity companies, but gas companies, traders. Um, the national grid is obviously the transmission network. Enedis is the counterpart for distribution networks in France. And um, in addition, we have the National Audit Office that scrutinizes policy in this country. And um, what used to be the Department of Energy and Climate Change, but is now the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. Uh, so we try and interact with policymakers and regulators and international organizations, as well as the people who are actually delivering the energy at the hard end. Okay, so what I want to talk about uh, is uh, to convince you that actually fairly mainstream economics is remarkably powerful in formulating questions and proposing ways of addressing and thinking of answers. But of course, um, climate change is a multidisciplinary problem. Uh, we rely, and I'm not a scientist, so I have to rely on my scientific colleagues for evidence on what's happening to the physical world. Um, we have a lot of engineering colleagues uh, who are telling us what's happening and what's coming down the road in terms of methods of reducing carbon emissions. Um, if you want to persuade people to change their lifestyles, you better understand their psychology. I'm going to argue very strongly that ethics plays a very large part in deciding what kind of policy you want. And then, of course, you have to get the policy ad uh, adopted, and that, that requires political scientists. So this is, this is a very broad range of disciplines that are needed to address such a complicated problem. So what I'm going to do is take a number of particular issues um, and show where economics comes in. I'm going to go through it pretty fast. Um, this isn't a lecture to equip you to answer questions in part 2B. This is just to show you that economics has actually got some very powerful tools available. Um, so I'm going to uh, start off with something that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and that is market failures, and in particular public goods and public bads and externalities, uh, and ask, well, what particular form do they take in this case, and what should one do about them? <clears throat> and that in particular addresses the question of 
Well, carbon dioxide is one of the main greenhouse gases. What should you do? Should you set a price on it, or should you set a cap on the quantity? <coughs> um, and having decided what you would like to do, how on earth do you persuade somebody to do it? Um, <coughs> and if they are willing to listen to you, then they might ask you, well, what should be the price of carbon? And that's where a lot of ethics and other issues of uncertainty come in. <coughs> and finally, um, a lot of the thrust, specifically in the European Union, for reducing the carbon intensity of electricity in particular, is to develop renewables, which, for the most part, in at least this part of the world, <coughs> are currently not competitive against the old fossil fuel. So the question is, what's the case for supporting them? How much should you support them? Which ones should you support? So these are questions that politicians or policy makers would like to know the answer to, and I'm going to suggest that economics actually has quite a good way <coughs> of beginning to answer them. Um, and um, in particular, I've, I've given a link here to a, a multidisciplinary program that we have supported by Energy at Cambridge. It's one of these interdisciplinary projects uh, where we have 14 different faculties uh, concerned with what is it about policy that makes it good or bad? Not just in energy, but what can we learn from other policy experiments? I mean, um, one of our <coughs> uh, collaborators with uh, Hong Kong University in China is looking at the lessons from clean air policy in this country in the 1950s and how that might be applied to Beijing now, which is, if you've ever been there, truly polluted. So there's some uh, useful stuff on the <coughs> website, uh, and we have fortnightly seminars at lunchtime, which are very interesting. Anyway, so let's get on to the challenges. <coughs> um, this is a quote from the Stern Review, which uh, Lord Stern was asked by the government to look at the case for addressing climate change. And his report, I think, has been enormously influential. And as a good economist, he said, climate change is a result of the greatest market failure the world has seen. So that's a standard economic concept. Um, and in particular, we're talking about a global, so whenever you emit carbon dioxide, it doesn't matter where you emit it, it's not a local pollutant, and it's a stock. What matters is the total quantity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. <clears throat> and that has very strong implications because it means it's not tremendously important when you emit it. What matters is how much there is in total. <clears throat> and in fact, um, I can jump ahead and take one of the graphs from the International um, Panel on uh, Climate Change. Uh, and it shows up the left-hand uh, y-axis the global average temperature. <clears throat> and along the bottom is the cumulative quantity of carbon that has been released since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> and what you will see is that the more you emit, the higher the likely temperature, and there's a considerable range of uncertainty about that. But if you take seriously that we would like to uh, remain below 2 degrees centigrade, uh, then, uh, and if you look along the bottom, you will see that we've got about 500 million tonnes of carbon that we can still release. But the amount of carbon in the form of fossil fuels waiting to be extracted is way more than that. So you begin to think it's really tempting to take that stuff out of the ground. And if you burn it, you add to the stock. And if you add to the stock, the temperature goes up. So it will be a good idea once you've burnt it to capture the carbon dioxide and put it back down again. So that gives you a very powerful message about the importance of carbon capture and storage, uh, which the Conservative government moved off the agenda and is now <laughs> being pressured to put back on the agenda. <clears throat> but to go back, um, the question we want to ask is, how should you best limit the cumulative amount of greenhouse gases, of which carbon is one of the most important? Should you restrict the annual amount that you release? Should you set a price? Should you issue permits for the remaining stock, the 500 million tonnes? And if so, how are you going to do it? Uh, so that immediately is a major question in political economy of the sort of thing that's discussed in the Conference of Parties periodically and currently in Bonn. <clears throat> OK, so let's um, just make some implications from that. 
If it's the total quantity that you emit, <coughs> it's the area under the emissions curve that matters. So if you start soon, uh, then you've got more time to gradually reduce, but if you leave it till later and you allow the total rate of emissions to go up and you still want to limit the total quantity, that's the total area under the diagram, uh, then you have to reduce much more quickly and that's clearly going to be far more difficult. So the implication of this is it would really be a good idea to start as soon as you can <coughs> to give yourself as much time as possible to adapt to what is a total change in the energy system of the planet. <coughs> Two degrees centigrade doesn't sound like an awful lot but that's not what really counts. So if you ask, well, what does that mean? That's the average temperature. What we're really interested in is the extremes of the temperature, and especially extreme high temperatures. That's what causes those dramatic cyclones and hurricanes and various other natural disasters, not to mention droughts, famines, and all the rest of it. And you can see when the uh, distribution just moves a little bit, the probability of the, what used to be the tails of that distribution, which used to be tiny, suddenly become really large. And the probability of as yet unforeseen events begins to become significant. So the old one in a hundred years flood may be one in ten years or one in five years. Um, and similarly with hurricanes. So the, the distribution as a whole, and I'll come back to this point, matters a lot. So your statistical knowledge is going to be taxed as well. <clears throat> OK, so let's ask what does the European Union propose to do about climate change? Uh, and it's a three-legged stool. So they say, well, it's clearly important to price the major greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide. Uh, and so they've set up an emission trading system which fixes the quantity and you allocate quotas to countries and then you have a market which determines by supply and demand what the price of those permits is, and I'm going to show why that actually doesn't work particularly well. <clears throat> then we have um, the so-called 2020-20 directive, which means that 20% of energy by 2020 should be renewables, and there should be a 20% reduction in demand and a 20% improvement in efficiency, all nice round numbers, the sort of things that politicians like. But what it really does do is put an onus on each country who have given or signed up to targets of how much effort they're going to put into delivering renewables in particular. The other ones, like the energy efficiency, are not so high on the agenda, although they probably should be. <clears throat> and I'm going to argue that there's some very good economic arguments for that. But what is really skillful from the political economy point of view is this has created a club good. So by membership of the European Union, for the moment, we at least subscribe collectively to finance something. And it's devolved so that the European Union doesn't say you must spend X pounds, it just says do it. And each country will figure out how best to do it. Um, the third leg is, is much weaker, and it's uh, essentially pointing out that low carbon technologies have experienced quite dramatic improvements in performance. And the implication is that doing research and development on these has high payoffs. Um, in the past, things like gas turbines, which we rely on for most of our electricity, or in particular the flexible part of that, <coughs> were developed by the military for jet engines. Uh, so there was a ready source of funding. Uh, for other things, uh, like uh, offshore wind, there's no obvious source of funding. Um, and it's important to create one. The problem with this is it doesn't place anything like the obligation that the Renewables Directive put on individual countries. It just said, wouldn't it be a good idea if we did it? Um, and it, so the funding is, is rather lacking. Um, and I'll come back to um, how you can justify that and indeed how you would measure what you should be doing uh, in a moment. OK, so why is the emissions trading system such complete crap? Uh, and this is... Um, uh, a graph showing the price of carbon. So in the first trading period, which was, as it were, a trial run, uh, the per permits that were allocated <coughs> um, were not, uh, you couldn't carry them over to the second period. So, of course, everybody lied through their teeth and they said, well, we really need a tremendous number of permits, but it's incredibly difficult to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and 
you can see that the price went up and up until they reported how much they were actually emitting. And at that point, the lie became obvious. They were able to reduce emissions <coughs> in relatively simple ways, uh, and the price crashed, and eventually it fell to zero. Uh, so the first period wasn't very successful. The second period, at least, if you don't use up your permit, this period you can hang on to it, and maybe at some stage it will become valuable. And you see, again, people became optimistic. The price went up. Then we had two bad things. The global financial crash was the bigger one. But we had the renewables directive that said, you have to increase the amount of renewables. But it didn't, therefore, reduce the number of carbon permits. So the total quantity of carbon that's being released doesn't change. So all the renewables that are being invested in do not reduce global emissions at all, which is, if you think about it, totally insane. <coughs> um, and so the price crashed. Uh, and then you can see um, people start worrying about it. So the Environment Agency in the European Union says, well, we should do something about it. And there's a sort of slight increase. And then they say, well, we should do even more about it. And the price actually goes down. And it's still pretty horribly low. But the point is, um, and let me immediately jump to, um, no, I'll come on to that later. What we want this signal to do is to guide investment in low carbon technology. Now, if you're going to build a nuclear power station, it takes 10 years to build and it'll last for 60 years, as opposed to a gas-fired power station, which takes two and a half years to build and lasts 20 years. It would really be useful to know what the carbon price is in 20, 30, 40 years' time, if you're going to make that choice. Uh, but the past evidence of the predictability and stability of that price is really hopeless and the level isn't something that you're going to um, jump out of bed and say we really really need to build a nuclear power station uh, so that doesn't work <clears throat> now we come to the more interesting question is well is it even the right way to go about it allocating permits and allowing them to trade to set a price uh, and there's a very old paper by 19 in by marty weitzman in 1974 who said, well, um, in a world of perfect certainty, it wouldn't matter if you fix the quantity and determine the price, or you fix the price and that delivered the quantity, they would be exactly the same. But in a world of uncertainty, uh, they're potentially very different. And in particular, it depends on the relative steepness of, the, if you like, the supply and demand curves. I'll come to that and illustrate it in a minute. <clears throat> and in particular, um, you want taxes or prices rather than permits, if the marginal benefit of abating or the marginal damage done by emitting is pretty flat uh, over the rate of emissions, um, and in particular if it's um, flatter than the um, marginal cost of abatement, which typically does tend to be rather steep as you run out of the low-hanging fruit. Um, and we can immediately say, well, if, if the Pollutant is a stock pollutant, so it's the total quantity that matters, not the rate at which you add to the quantity. Then that marginal damage curve is going to be pretty flat over the rate of abatement. Uh, so you should have prices. Well, why do we have permits? And the short answer is it's much easier to introduce a trading system if you allocate permits to the people who know what they're worth, otherwise known as large industrial companies, <clears throat> and the great unwashed public have no idea that these free permits will cause the price of their energy to go up and become more expensive. So they don't object, whereas the people who would object and would lobby are being given these free permits. So it's really in, um, a, a good political move to introduce the permits, but then you really want to move away from them and fix the price once you've bribed all the people to not complain. So this is, roughly speaking, the story. So you can see, uh, supposing you think that um, <coughs> Q star was what you thought was the right amount, <coughs> and you could fix that quantity, or you could fix the price at T star. <coughs> but supposing you just um, don't know, and it turns out that the marginal cost of abatement isn't where you thought it was, uh, and so Actually, given the marginal benefit curve, the best place to be isn't here, it's here. <coughs> well, what's the damage done? 
Um, this is normal consumer surplus. So this, this is the error, the cost, that you would run into if you fix the quantity. But if you fix the price, the price is actually quite close to where it would be because the marginal abatement curve is so, so flat. Uh, so the errors, the cost of that loss, is actually very small. Uh, so the cost of the errors you make in fixing the price are likely to be much lower than the cost of errors, and there will be errors because we really don't have enough information, uh, if you fix the quantity. You're bound to get the answer wrong, but which one is the worst one to get wrong? So that's, a, I think, a very powerful argument for why you should fix the price. And that's just saying what I've just said. Okay, so um, the British government, when it was concerned about having passed the Climate Change Act, which said we really do have to reduce carbon emissions, how are we going to do it? The Treasury said, well, clearly the emissions trading price is useless. We need to have a, a price which people can look ahead and predict. So you, they said, okay, we're going to have a tax which will bring the price of carbon for fuels in the electricity sector from what we think the forward price will be up to what we think it should be. And in particular, we think that by 2030, instead of being under five pounds a tonne, it should be closer to 70 pounds a tonne, at which point even Hinkley Point might look as though it's economically viable. Uh, and since um, we are going to need large, um, low carbon forms of energy, uh, Hinkley Point, relatively speaking, may well be one of the cheaper options. So that would say, OK, <coughs> um, if you're making investments in the energy sector or the electricity sector, uh, that, that's what to worry about. <coughs> um, OK, but how do you fix the price of carbon? What is the right price of carbon? There is one snag. We thought, or the Treasury thought, that isn't it a blindingly obvious thing to do to tax bad things rather than to tax good things like labour? And wouldn't Europe in a financial crisis be quite attracted by the idea of shifting their taxes from labour where there's a big unemployment problem to bad things like carbon? So we thought other countries would do the same and of course they didn't. Uh, and so the government then was worried about the competitive position of energy intensive industries and lowered <coughs> the carbon price uh, rather rapidly. So the durability or the credibility of government tax interventions unfortunately is no better than the European emissions trading system. Um, <coughs> and they have to think of other ways and they have thought of other ways of trying to do that. Okay, so um, the Stern Review spends a lot of time working out what the social cost of carbon is and how you should think about it. So the idea is fairly straightforward. If you release a tonne of carbon dioxide or <coughs> carbon now, <coughs> um, one tonne of carbon is the same as 3.67 tonnes of carbon dioxide, so you've got to be careful which units you do, <coughs> then it's going to create damage over the future. And unfortunately, it's an extremely persistent pollutant. It's going to last for hundreds of years. <coughs> the time um, constant for adapting the temperature of the ocean, which affects the melting of the ice caps and the um, height of the ocean in particular, the flooding risk, has a time constant of between 1,000 and 4,000 years. Uh, it takes 4,000 years for the temperature to completely circulate through the ocean system. So we're talking about very long-term effects. <coughs> uh, and so the future really matters. Uh, and that means the discount rate really matters. Uh, and you can see, very simple calculation, if you did what uh, Bill Nordhaus says and discount future damages at 5%, then 100 years' worth of damage isn't worth peanuts today. So a million pounds in 100 years is worth less than 8,000 pounds today. But if you discount at Stern's social discount rate of 1.4%, uh, then it's a quarter of a million pounds. And there's clearly a huge difference between what it would be worth spending now to avoid that damage, depending on the discount rate. So where does the discount rate come from? Well, <coughs> uh, it depends on economics and ethics. So it depends upon the rate of growth of consumption if you're a utilitarian, and that seems to be quite a good place to start. And it depends <coughs> upon the elasticity of marginal utility, which isn't just a personal thing because you're comparing people's consumption now with different people's consumption in the future. So you're making interpersonal comparisons, and you inevitably have to do that if you're going to make policy choices 
that influence the outcomes for the future. And it, rate, it also depends upon the pure rate of time preference, uh, which um, Martin Rees, who runs the Center for Existential Risk, reckons is what's the probability of us all being wiped out per year. Um, and 1% actually is rather high if you think about it. <coughs> so maybe it should be lower, maybe it should be higher. It depends how optimistic or pessimistic you are about asteroids, nuclear warfare, and various <coughs> other bad things. <coughs> OK, so let's come on to the ethics. Um, so you have to ask, who's going to get the damage? Is it going to be poor people in the future in other parts of the world? Your grandchildren, or both, or everybody? Clearly, it's a pretty broad concept. And this, this elasticity, new, uh, is a very good way of thinking about that, because it says, well, if somebody's twice as rich, what's the value of giving them an extra pound compared to giving it to somebody who's only half as rich as they are? <coughs> uh, and the answer is, um, in this case, because they're twice as rich, it's 1 over 2 times V. <coughs> uh, so the answer is the weighting uh, you might want to place uh, measures how much more worthwhile you think poor people's consumption is than rich people's. <coughs> and I find a very persuasive argument that says that should be equal to 1. Uh, for the following reason, if you look at um, the way people measure the value of life or statistical life saved by improving uh, road conditions or health outcomes or various other things that affect mortality, <coughs> then if, if uh, nu equals 1, uh, it says that the value of a life is independent of your level of income. And that sort of sounds ethically quite plausible. Uh, if you want to argue something different, you have to say, well, why are different people in different positions have lives which are differently valued? But that, that is an ethical judgment. Economists can point to the implications of that judgment, but essentially it requires that we sit down and think about it. <coughs> OK, so um, I'm, I'm arguing for rather a low rate of discount, which means the future really matters, otherwise we don't bother. But there's a further factor, and that is that <coughs> um, risk, um, small risks of really bad things happening actually have a disproportionate effect on what you want to do. <coughs> uh, so let me just jump ahead and try and illustrate that. And it all comes down to the difficulty of knowing what the distribution of outcomes are. So again, it's a statistical problem. <coughs> So we're pretty good at working out what the mean of a set of observations is. But measuring the tails is, by definition, unbelievably difficult. Because, by definition, <coughs> the tails are things that don't happen very often. So you're not going to observe very many instances of them. <coughs> and it's really dangerous to say, oh, it must be a normal distribution, because that's the easiest one to work with. And you can see that a four sigma standard deviation has that unbelievably high probability of not happening, or an incredibly low probability of happening. But as you probably know, in the stock market, people are saying, whoops, we've just had two four sigma standard deviations in the last week. So quite clearly, the distribution of outcomes is not normal. Uh, so it's got fat tails. But we just don't know how fat those tails are, because we haven't got very many observations. So if you're cautious and precautionary, you say, well, they might be quite fat, <coughs> in which case we're going to attach more weight to them than the normal distribution would be. And that's going to mean that maybe in 95% of the outcomes in the future, everything's just fine. But in 5%, it's going to be really, really bad. And it's those 5% multiplied by this inverse elasticity, this uh, measure that says if you're really poor, you put a very high weight on it, that's going to overweight those op low probability events. And it again says effectively low discount rates because <coughs> those events are important. But let me just jump back and say, um, and I should have put this earlier, <coughs> this I think is one of the more scary graphs that the IEA has produced. And it says, um, most of the emissions are already locked into the kind of equipment we have and, unbelievably important, the housing stock we have. The housing stock in this country was mostly built 50 or more years ago, and we replace half a percent of it per annum if everything's going well, which at the moment it isn't. So the rate at which we're improving the capability of reducing our emissions is really low. And so what that says is, 
we've locked in an awful lot of what's going to happen in the future and the amount of freeway we have is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, so it becomes critically important to choose the right investments and the right building stock and the right forms of generation and the right kind of cars and all the rest of it if we're going to stay underneath that envelope that has a sporting chance of not exceeding two degrees. Okay, so um, let's look at some of the implications of carbon prices. And one place where it shows <coughs> up very quickly indeed <coughs> is in the electricity sector in this country and in many countries you can burn coal and you can burn gas. And coal has twice as much carbon as gas actually slightly more in terms of because the efficiency of coal is usually lower. <coughs> so depending on the price of coal and the price of gas and the price of carbon, uh, you will either choose to burn gas or choose to burn coal. <coughs> and the consequences of that are really quite dramatically visible. So this, this shows the amount of electricity that's produced from different fuels. So we have nuclear power down here. <coughs> we import or export some down here. And then we have all sorts of renewables here. <coughs> but the big things are gas and coal. And you can see that <coughs> in the period from 2012 to about 2015, the price of coal was low and the price of gas was high because the price of oil was high. And so what happened was what had been a rather large amount of gas production was squeezed and the amount of coal production went up. But then <coughs> the price of gas came down, but we also introduced a carbon price. And as a result, we've squeezed coal out. And um, amazingly, last year, um, we had days in which, for the first time in 100 years, we generated no electricity from coal burning for over 100 years. So <clears throat> the price of carbon has a short-run impact, which is very good, so getting it wrong is really costly, uh, but it also has a long-run effect because it influences whether you <clears throat> invest in nuclear power or renewables or gas or coal. And each of those has very different... All of these ones are zero carbon. This one has less than half the carbon of that. So how are we going to convince a politician uh, that we really need a high enough carbon price. So there's a very tempting approach that says, well, we're not sure what the social cost of carbon is because we don't really know what the damage in the future is. In any case, the social discount rates and the probability distributions and all the rest of it mean there's a large range of uncertainty. But what we do know is that we really have to guide investment decisions to low carbon choices. So it surely ought to be at least high enough to make those low carbon choices preferable to the high carbon choices. And that sounds like a very promising and practical and pragmatic approach that you could sell to a politician. Well, there's a problem, uh, and it's very simple to explain. So the carbon intensity of natural gas is about 0.2 tonnes per megawatt hour of thermal content of the gas. <coughs> Uh, so, if the gas price is going to go up by one dollar a megawatt hour, then to offset the fact that the lower carbon alternative has now become more expensive, you need a higher carbon price, and it's just one over 0.19 times as high, so it's got to go up more than five times as much. So what that tells you is that fluctuations in the price of gas feed through into much larger fluctuations in the price of carbon you need to persuade people to burn gas rather than coal. <coughs> and the same with coal, except it's less sensitive to that, it's only about three times as much. <coughs> now, that might not matter too much if you knew what the prices of these fuels were, but this is just taking um, one of the forecasts of the Department of Energy and Climate Change, and it does gas, gas and coal. <coughs> the first thing you see is, in the past, they've been jumping around all over the place. <coughs> um, and <coughs> the range in the future, which you have to say is, I don't believe that, because that range is actually lower than we've recently experienced in the past. Uh, <coughs> the gas price range <coughs> is wider, but again, we've seen the price of gas treble 
in the recent past. Uh, so <coughs> if you pin your hope on fixing the price of carbon on the price of fuels, <coughs> then it's a very shaky um, uh <coughs> foundation on which to build it. <coughs> um, and effectively, you're going to probably say, as this government is announcing, um, well, the simplest thing is just to say, we don't build any more coal power, and <laughs> regardless of the price. I mean, the price is going to have to be high. We don't know how high, so why not just tell people what the right answer is? <coughs> and that's highly objectionable to so some views, but um, at least has the advantage of giving some clarity. <coughs> and this is just saying the same thing. So depending on the price of gas and the price of carbon dioxide, <coughs> whether you invest in wind or gas-fired generation um, uh, will depend very sensitively on those results. <coughs> and the point I'd like to make is this range along the x-axis <coughs> is within the range that we've seen in the last 10 years, whereas the range up on the carbon price axis <coughs> is huge. I mean, we're talking about, and we remember it's about five pounds in the emissions trading system, up to 200 pounds. So these, these are not insignificant consequences. If you want to steer investment decisions through the carbon price, <coughs> uh, then it's going to um, really be quite uh, tricky to do it with any precision. <coughs> okay. Um, now, I want to also spend um, some time talking about renewables. Uh, I think this, this involves almost every aspect of economics, and especially the more hard bits, or I mean, not so much hard, but less well understood bits um, that there are going. <coughs> okay, so the Renewables Directive, this 2020-20 directive, um, everybody sat round <coughs> and agreed how much they would reduce their share of total energy. And the UK <coughs> had already decided to introduce renewable obligation certificates. These are green certificates. So if you have a windmill and you produce a megawatt hour, you get one certificate. <coughs> and the um, company selling you electricity has to have a certain fraction of its sales covered by these certificates or it has to pay a, um, <coughs> a penalty price. <coughs> um, now, if you think about it, you're, you're uh, a developer, you want to build a wind farm and you say, well, I get these green certificates on top of the value of the electricity. Uh, so I want to go to the bank and convince them to lend me some money. So how do I predict what the value of these green certificates are? Well, it's determined by supply and demand. So I have to predict how many other people are going to build windmills and, um, and also have to predict what the government's ambition is going to be for how much, uh, what share of the output the suppliers need to cover. <coughs> uh, and we also need to predict the electricity price. And that's pretty difficult. Uh, so here's um, a period from 2003 up to 2012. So here is the spot price of electricity, the uh, reference price in the day ahead market. <coughs> and this is the price of the green certificates, which is actually quite stable because you don't have to use them up. You can store them and value sell them when you think they're more valuable. <coughs> but when you add the two together, you can see that the uh, price you're getting for your generation uh, is pretty volatile. So if you go along to the bank when the price is high and say, this is a really good investment, lend me the money, the banker might say, yes, but six months ago it was half as high, and so it's clearly highly risky, and <coughs> I'll only allow you <coughs> to finance your investment with 10% debt, and the rest will have to be equity. Uh, so this, this scheme doesn't work particularly well. <coughs> as a result, we've introduced what the rest of the, or what most of the continent does, and that is you fix the price that the renewables get, so you reduce that risk, and that means you can finance it with debt, which is much, much cheaper than equity. <coughs> okay, but um, how should we support these renewables in particular? Should we support the output, megawatt hours, or something else? Uh, well, why are we doing it? And the answer is, um, and I can jump ahead to show this, uh, if you look at renewables, this is solar PV, uh, then every time you double the installed capacity or the total amount that's been produced to date, <coughs> and this is a logarithmic scale on both axes, 
uh, you drive the price down or the cost of these modules down by somewhere over 20%. This is a 20% per annum reduction for each doubling of installed capacity. <coughs> and it's probably closer to 23%. So that is a learning spillover in that if I install some PV now, the manufacturers will then be able to produce in the future at a lower cost, which other people installing their stuff later will benefit from. <coughs> I don't get compensated for having delivered that reduction in costs. So it's, it's a learning externality <coughs> um, and as a result there's a case for correcting that market failure, it's, um, uh, <coughs> compensate people for installing stuff now in order to reduce the cost in the future. But what's, what matters is the cumulative amount that's been produced, not when they've been installed, how much electricity or, uh, they produce, but how much installed capacity you've put in place. Um, and this is, this is a similar log-log scale for wind, uh, and the learning rate here is, is lower, 7% instead of 23%. <coughs> Um, <coughs> but on the other hand, and the other, the other problem is that you can see down here the quantities that have been installed are really large, so doubling that is a really, really big investment, <coughs> like £647 billion pounds worth maybe. Um, but anyway, it's still worth doing. <coughs> uh, so um, I've done some calculations to say, well, what is this learning benefit worth? How much would it have been worth paying people in the past to install these solar PV panels when they were much more expensive. And so this is a measure along here <coughs> well, um, of the um, value of the spillover. And you can see back not that long ago, it might have been $780 per kilowatt of peak capacity. So if you imagine a solar panel on your roof, um, a typical biggish one would be four kilowatts. So. <coughs> we're talking here about a very substantial justified subsidy which is falling over time but it's still something like 22% of the cost. The cost has been coming down as I've shown you very dramatically. Uh, <coughs> so that, that says yeah it really is worth it um, and when you're thinking of how you should allocate your research and development and your deployment support you can say well which one gives me the biggest bang for the buck? It's larger for PV at the moment than it is for wind. <coughs> okay, so uh, we did learn um, way back here when we had renewable obligation certificates, despite Britain being a really windy country compared to um, Germany in particular and Spain, uh, we were doing a pretty hopeless job in terms of generating electricity from this wind. <coughs> uh, but then we started thinking more carefully about how better to support it and we gave these more riskless um, support systems and the rate now is accelerating quite impressively fast um, and just just when it really seemed to be taking off the government said our conservative voters don't like windmills and so we won't support them anymore we'll put them all off in the North Sea where they're out of sight and much more expensive okay but let's go back to the practical question of if you were advising the minister on re reforming the support system, how would you do it? Well, we want to encourage the installation of stuff that works. So here is one possible method <coughs> which they actually use in parts of China. So you can say um, different places will have different amount of wind or different amounts of sunshine. <coughs> um, <coughs> the value of the electricity you produce once you've installed it is the same, but the benefit is to install it. So if I ask you in an auction, how much do you need to be paid per megawatt hour for the first 20,000 full production <coughs> hours of your output? Now, if you go to a windy place, it, you get those hours more quickly, <coughs> probably 2,500 full hours a year in good parts of England and Scotland, and maybe only 1,800 hours in less windy places, so it will take you longer. But sooner or later, you're going to get all your money, providing the windmill works. <coughs> and that's all you need to know if you're going to go to a bank and say, give me the money and I guarantee I'm going to pay it back because I've got a fixed price for this quantity of electricity and that's a fixed quantity of money. So this reduces the risk 
and it concentrates the support on what you want to support, which is the installed capacity, not the production. Production of electricity is paid for in the electricity market. <clears throat> we don't want to distort the electricity market just because we're trying to deploy these new technologies. <clears throat> um, and it has a very important other consequence in that um, we don't um, over-reward the wrong places. So <clears throat> you can imagine um, up there in the top left-hand corner of Britain, where it's really, really windy, it's also really far away from London and places like that where the people actually live. <clears throat> Whereas um, in East Anglia, the wind isn't so good, but it's a hell of a lot closer to where everybody lives. <clears throat> so you can see here, I've said, well, supposing you get 2,000 hours a year here, 2,500 hours a year up there, <clears throat> and let's suppose that the renewable obligation certificate pays you 50 pounds a megawatt hour. <clears throat> then what happens is um, if the local price there, which allows for the cost of moving the electricity, is 35 pounds, then you get 85 pounds when you add on that, <clears throat> and that gives you um, that amount of money, <clears throat> which is more than down here. But if you paid for the installation and not the renewable obligation certificate, which magnifies the benefit of being up in the northwest, there would be fewer windmills in the northwest. We wouldn't have to spend three billion pounds building undersea cables to connect Scotland to the rest of England. And we would put the wind where it was more sensibly deployed, which is closer to where everybody is. Unfortunately, <coughs> it's also closer to conservative voters. So <coughs> um, if we... Um, change the system of support. We not only stop over-rewarding Scottish landowners, but we also stop having to spend an enormous amount in unnecessary transmission investment. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up, and what I hope I've convinced you is that the economics you learn, <coughs> traditional economics, public finance, econometrics, risk and uncertainty, um, combined with all these other disciplines of psychology, how do people behave, how do you persuade politicians to do things, what is the ethical case for doing things, all matter. <clears throat> and you can see that in particular cases, where if we're talking about <clears throat> a global stock public good, we need collective action, we need to address the stock issue, not the flow issue. That means we have to think about prices rather than quantities. We know that it's easy to introduce quantities, but then we have to, as the British government did, evolve towards a better and more stable and more credible price signal. <coughs> um, what that price should be, the social cost of carbon, is a highly, um, I'm not going to say subjective, but ethically based, <coughs> and also based on, well, what do you think the future world might look like and what are the risks it might face? And those are very hard questions to answer with any precision. So there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and you have to ask how do you deal with that uncertainty? How do you factor it in to the advice? <coughs> um, and in particular, um, how do you make sure we don't lock ourselves in to very durable decisions in the housing stock and the electricity generating capital and the transport systems that you develop <coughs> that we will then come to regret? Um, and when we're thinking about developing the technologies, <clears throat> they don't just, uh, well, to some extent, they do fall off trees <coughs> providing you plant the trees, but you do have to have mechanisms for supporting the research, development, deployment, demonstration, all the rest of it, for the things that are not yet commercial, but which look as though they might be if we were to make these technological breakthroughs. And the evidence, when we have started putting resources seriously into these technologies, Lithium batteries for your laptops are another good example where the spillovers for electric vehicles have proven to be rather good. <coughs> they do justify support. Um, ideally, in a collective club good way, the bigger the club, the better, because the more money you get, because everybody benefits. <coughs> and um, then you target it on where the payoffs look as though they're best <coughs> and stop deploying it to where the things are not well um, <coughs> proven or don't seem to be likely to make breakthroughs. So um, economics combined with a lot of other disciplines has a great deal to offer in this energy policy space.
So I commend it to you as one of the more exciting areas in which to spend a life as I have done working. Good, let me stop and let's have some questions. <clears throat> Um, what I've said is you should support the installation of the wind farm and that would be all you needed to do if the carbon price were correct um, because the other electricity coming from fossil fuels would include the carbon price and would be more expensive. But if the carbon price is too low, <coughs> then by generating the wind you displace some of the fossil generation <coughs> and in principle you should get a credit for that, for the value of the displaced carbon. Now, this is where we come back to the problems with the emissions trading system because unfortunately, the more wind farms Britain installs, the more enthusiastically the Germans run their coal-fired power stations because we lower the carbon price and they can burn more coal and get away with it. So the total quantity of carbon actually doesn't change. But that's a fault of fixing the quantity. If we fix the price, then we would actually displace carbon and it would be worth doing it. So we have to fix the particular way in which we um, market or trade carbon in order to produce a sensible answer to displacing carbon in one country. On the point you mentioned towards the end about the risks of technology market, um, do you think there's a danger by people, by politicians in particular, but decision makers everywhere, beginning to understand that these are very complex decisions? And because they're fearful about making the wrong decision that will have long-term consequences that they're difficult to undo, they end up not taking action when in fact they should. Well, as you say, not taking an action is actually a policy and will lead to making the wrong decisions. Uh, so, I mean, I think in, in many ways Britain is commendable in saying let's set up the Climate Change Act and an independent committee on climate change which publishes budgets and then holds the government to account and the government has to respond and saying um, to what extent it's actually doing things that will deliver those carbon reductions. So, you know, banning coal-fired power stations from 2025 <coughs> is one such, perhaps, rather dramatic example. Um, but, you know, inaction actually has consequences. And I, I keep stressing the critical importance of these decisions are irreversible for a very long period of time. If you build a house which is poorly insulated, the cost of retrofitting that is very high. But if you build it in the first place, well insulated, that's not very much more expensive. And it will last for 50 or 100 years. So getting it right really matters. Yes, that not a problem though, the policy is more short term, looking at sort of four year terms. Well, a week in politics is thought to be a long time, yeah. yes, yes, that's a problem. <clears throat> and that's why I think um, thinking carefully about the institutional framework <clears throat> uh, becomes very important. So having independent regulators like Ofgem, <clears throat> which sets fairly long-term targets, having the Committee on Climate Change publishing carbon budgets, <clears throat> having these uh, collective agreements in the European Union where you sign up to do something which in the 2020 cases, by 2020 you will have delivered this particular uh, set of outcomes. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and the COP21 in Paris, in a sense, was a collective agreement to make a long-term commitment to reducing carbon emissions. <clears throat> um, but you're absolutely right, and the Treasury example of the carbon price support in this country was something where it lasted for about a year and a half before they changed it. So. Um, Yes, thinking, thinking through institutional and governance arrangements for these policies are, is a very large part of actually making them work. And economics can only go so far and say what you might want to do, but actually how you design that system is a much broader problem. 
Yes. And what would you think would be such a mechanism that would fix the price on a global scale? How do you convince politicians to do what's in the interests of future generations? Um, <clears throat> well, I don't know. I'm not a political scientist. Um, but I, mean, I went to Beijing in 2011, and one of the things I found very interesting was the impacts of climate change on the northwest of the country, and in particular the increased prevalence of droughts, was already appreciated and the link between that and global emissions was perceived as uh, a, a factor that had to be taken into account. Um, and then there are other things that can help. So India and China burn a lot of coal, which has terrible air pollution, quite apart from carbon dioxide emissions. The, um, if you go to Delhi and uh, the air there is equivalent to smoking 50 cigarettes a day. So you start thinking, well, really, it would be quite a good idea to reduce coal burning. And incidentally, that will also reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, so finding co-benefits, other reasons for doing things that are in the collective interest is also desirable. Uh, but we've seen, we've been at it since Kyoto was, what, 1992? And uh, here we are post-Paris and Trump is taking America out of it, but fortunately lots of states in America are staying in. Uh, it's difficult. It's the argument that says politics is a very short-term issue uh, is, is with us, yes. Yes? So I have one question. The current debate focuses on carbon dioxide mainly, whereas there are other factors that might also be taken into consideration, for example, nuclear energy and the costs for storing nuclear waste, radioactive nuclear waste, for an infinite amount of time. And I think that in this area there's a lot of like, open research questions how to take these long term costs into, into the like, current pricing uh, methods. And so I would like to know what, what's your opinion on, on the price of nuclear um, technology, electricity, and, and things that are not like, covered in the price. Well, as you um, hinted, uh, car, uh, nuclear power is highly controversial. <coughs> uh, for some rather good reasons, mostly connected with the nuclear power programs in most countries, was initially designed to produce plutonium to make atomic bombs out of. And that's not a very nice legacy to associate with the production of energy. <coughs> uh, so um, now the problem, as you've said, is, well, what do we do about two things? One is uh, the risk of it going bang, the Chernobyl problem, and the secondly is how do we do with the legacy wastes? Uh, so, <coughs> um, at this point I tend to ask people, well, which do you think is the most dangerous way in terms of lives lost per megawatt hour produced of generating electricity? Anybody can answer. Coal's bad. No. No, no, I'm just asking this question first. We'll come back to you in a minute. So the answer is hydroelectricity, which on the face of it sounds wonderfully green, but whenever a dam bursts, you wipe out large numbers of people. Uh, and if you ask how many people have been wiped out by nuclear accidents, the answer is unbelievably tiny numbers. So it's one of these, um, it's a rare event with a potentially large outcome. How do you value that? And people tend to do it in a very irrational way or a subjective or behavioral way and they, there's a dread factor of something that you don't really understand affecting you. But every time you fly across the Atlantic and are exposed to cosmic rays, you're getting much more radiation than you would. And I've stood on top of a nuclear power station pile uh, than you would in most nuclear power stations. So <coughs> there is that aspect. But then the legacy wastes, uh, we know how to deal with it. It's just we can't persuade people to do it. Uh, except in Scandinavia, where they're putting it deep underground in very, very stable rock formations. Um, but if you do that, then the problem shouldn't be very serious. But we haven't got the energy to do it yet. Yes? Um, it might be a bit off topic, but I was wondering what you think about suggestions of geoengineering. <laughs> well, we, we have 
very interesting conferences, and um, we mostly have conferences on the sort of topics of the day, but we usually get an after-dinner speaker to talk about something wild and woolly, and we have had geoengineers talk about um, <laughs> doing stuff. Um, and the answer is it's pretty scary, because first of all, we don't quite know what would happen if you did it, and secondly, most of them have huge distributional impacts, so that they might benefit one country and massively adversely affect other countries. Uh, so <coughs> there are, there are um, you know, there's a case for saying, well, we ought to look at it and see what it potentially can offer. But when you start looking at most of the proposals, uh, they look even more complicated than the things we already know how to do, which would have quite a big impact. <coughs> Sorry, I, I cut you off short. So do, do you want to come back? Um, well, I, I've said that's actually a difficult question because we want a high enough price that makes investing in low carbon attractive. <coughs> but the question is, how high that price is depends upon how cheap or expensive the other fuels are. And they vary enormously. Uh, so um, I'm increasingly persuaded that setting standards, so we have an emissions performance standard at the moment that says <coughs> you um, mustn't emit more than 450 kilograms per megawatt hour of electricity over the course of a year per megawatt of capacity times the number of hours. So <coughs> you can say, well, that <coughs> practically means I shouldn't build a coal-fired power station. Or you might just say, you can't build a coal-fired power station. Or you can only build a coal-fired power station if it has carbon capture and storage capturing at least 90% of the carbon dioxide. <coughs> so uh, standards, as opposed to tax instruments, for instance, for the efficiency of your refrigerator, are arguably a much more direct way of cutting through to making sure that the decisions are indeed low carbon. I wonder how that will align with the, what you said about what is important is the amount of carbon dioxide that we have out there and the, the proper limit that we have. So, okay, so I've said, okay, 500 million tonnes of carbon, that's all there is left. <coughs> um, in a world in which you could say, who gets how much? Is it per person? Is it two tonnes of carbon dioxide per person per year? If you could solve that problem, which is not easy, <coughs> then you could hand out all these permits and that if you could commit yourself never to issue any more, <coughs> uh, then, then the system might work. Um, but that's not how it's done. It's done with budgets of five years uh, and that is much closer to a flow-based system. Uh, on my system of uh, setting the price, um, <coughs> effectively, you suck it and see. So if you find the price is too low and you're still emitting too much, you raise the price. I mean, it's, but it's not going to be the only instrument that you need. It's, it's going to require a range of interventions. And a lot of those have to do with the way people behave. So people may respond <coughs> to efficiency ratings on white goods much more directly than if you tell them um, that the price of carbon dioxide it releases will increase the cost of running it. I mean, it's just a more direct way of getting that information across or setting <coughs> performance standards for cars so you don't have to go around um, wondering which one is the right one. You just say all the new ones have to meet a certain standard. And that, an awful lot of that is behavioural economics. What is the best way of producing um, what looks like a better answer? Yes. Thanks for the presentation, it's really interesting. Um, you touched briefly on the geographical dispersion of wind or solar generation in the UK. More generally thinking about that, Point. Uh, I mean, to what extent is there a problem of intermittent renewable technologies um, coming concentrated around um, windier or sunnier nodes um, where they're coming at a higher price and then you end up in a situation where we do have high levels of 
windmills, solar hours, uh, occurring and driving down the spot price and the sort of space situation where you might not have people uh, efficiently allocating across the country. Yeah. Um, is that something that we could also think about using some of those pricing tools and missions to well, there's, a, there's a, a well known sensible solution, which is <coughs> you have nodal pricing which calculates the marginal cost or marginal value of electricity at each point on the electricity system. Uh, so, <coughs> and you can say there's been lots of very good studies in California and places like that showing <coughs> that beyond a certain point, putting more wind farms or more solar panels near this part of the country doesn't make sense because the value of the electricity falls so far that the fact that it's sunny isn't much help and you better locate where it's less sunny but the value is higher. So there are very good ways of guiding where the new investments should be. Um, at the moment <coughs> the problem in Germany is a very good example. So all the solar locates down in the south <coughs> and it's crashed the price but the price is a Germany-wide price. So there's no encouragement to say, wouldn't it be better to go a bit further north? They get the same price wherever they are, and they get it, however, uh, for each megawatt hour. So we're a long way from having the right systems of supporting intermittent renewables. Um, but that doesn't mean to say there's not quite a lot of work that's been done on how we should do it. Many of those papers are on our website. Yes? Um, probably a bit of a strange one, but if you've got a country like um, really far north, like Russia, for example, not much sun or hydroelectric potential. How would that work into um, a pricing system if they can't, if they don't have the ability to do renewables very well? Well, Russia has fabulous hydro resources and a lot of nuclear power. Or well, okay, so they can't they can't power 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 um, like Baltics, for example, or somewhere flat northern. <laughs> well. Um, the best combination is if you've got a lot of wind and hydroelectricity because then when the wind doesn't blow you use the hydropower behind the dam and if the wind does blow you just keep the water there and wait until you need it. So that, that's a really nice arrangement. So there are not many countries in that situation. Spain, Norway, a few others, but not many. <coughs> um, Russia is actually not too badly off for hydro. Um, so, but the short answer is um, Again, where you put the renewables, in a sense, doesn't really matter because it displaces carbon at some stage. Uh, so you can imagine, um, well, think of the renewables directive. The obvious thing to do would be to say every country hands over a certain fraction of their GDP <coughs> into an auction fund that allocates it to whoever will produce the uh, um, renewables energy at lowest cost. So we get the wind in Scotland or northern England and we get the sun in southern Spain and southern Italy. And instead of everybody doing a bit of each um, in, a, in a not particularly sensible way. But of course that runs up against the political problem of I want to say it's my renewable power and it's what I've done. Yeah. <coughs> Does that not also run against the problem of transporting the electricity? Well, that comes back to the question of what's it worth in this particular place. So if you've properly signalled the value of electricity, which is hard to move power away from, then they'll be discouraged from locating it there and they'll put it somewhere where it's more valuable. Yes, so there are many wheels that have to be uh, turning correctly for this to give the right answer. If we're going to rely on renewables, does each country not have to have a balance of different renewable sources? if there's still that problem of transporting the electricity from the source? Well, it would come out in the wash in the sense that um, if you've got a lot of hydro, then you can afford to have a huge amount of wind near the hydro. <coughs> and if you don't, you might want to not have too much wind and some sun because wind and sun are not perfectly correlated. And it's usually a good idea to connect yourself <coughs> to somewhere far away because if the wind's blowing here, it might not be blowing there and you can move the power backwards and forwards. So the, the benefit, well, for instance, we're, we're um, planning a, <coughs> a large connection to Norway. And that will make a lot of sense because if we have surplus power, we can send it to Norway and they can keep their dams full. And when we don't, they can send the power to us, as they do at the moment between Denmark and Norway. Yes? 
question. Uh, would it be wise to uh, include the emission costs of the transportation of the fuel to the uh, CO emission scheme? Because what I can picture is then if just natural gas is used instead of coal, might be worth to import it like from the US via liquefied natural gas and then you wouldn't really decrease the total amount of carbon emissions because there's a huge waste included. Yeah, you're right. Liquefying and re gasifying gas uses energy. So the carbon content of the gas that's delivered by LNG is higher than gas that comes straight out of the ground. You can deal with that in principle. Uh, the problem is crosses international borders <coughs> and we actually find it quite difficult even to tax airplanes and ships on the carbon emissions they have at the moment, although we're working on it. So yes, in a world in which everything is properly priced, that comes out in the wash. Otherwise, uh, well, it, it's like we reduce our carbon emissions by closing down our factories and importing goods from China, which produces the emissions. So if you do it on the basis of what is the carbon content of what we actually consume, Britain doesn't look anything like as good as what's the carbon content of what we produce. So it's, it's an imperfect world so far. Yes. Um, so I'm just wondering, how big a role does the government play when it comes to the very externality that we talk about in order to kind of incentivize and encourage producers for more knowledge sharing? I guess in general, like, how can we overcome this very externality? Well, um, so governments by and large quite like intervening. The problem is that they just pile on policy on top of policy on top of policy and they all interact in rather perverse ways. So if you look at electricity <coughs> bills, you've got um, extra uh, charges for energy efficiency, for the climate change levy, for um, warm homes, for this, that and the other. <coughs> and it doesn't add up to a very coherent policy. Um, on the other hand, once you've built up a constituency of people, constituency of people who rely on these particular subsidies, it's very difficult to dismantle them. So um, policy making, as they say, is rather like sausage <coughs> making. You really don't want to know what goes into it. You just hope what comes out is not too bad. OK, guys, we have time for one more question. In the back? Uh, I was wondering your views on the Zardes campaign and whether it could be an effective tool for taking capital away from high carbon uh, sources of energy? Um, well, I suppose it's a bit like would you refuse to take a bus or a car unless it were electric? At what point do we think? I mean, at some stage we may not need the oil that um, drives almost the entire transport fleet, especially aircraft. <coughs> so I think there's a degree of um, I don't know, hypocrisy in saying we don't like the company, but we're perfectly willing to go on using the things that it produces. Um, I would rather say, let's tax the things to reflect the damage they do. And a consequence of that will be the companies that produce them will produce less of them. If the externalities are properly internalized, that would seem to be the right way to go rather than if we refuse to buy shares in Shell, somebody else gets them cheaper and they go on being, I don't know, it's, it's uh, way too complicated an issue to embark on at this late stage in the day. Thank you so much for coming. It was a great pleasure having you.